Okay, well, thank you, Brian, for the introduction. Um, yeah, it's been a little while since I was a student in Brent's lab. Um, but uh, today I'm going to be sharing with you some of our um, results from the population genetics um, uh, portion of the Dimensions of Biodiversity grant. Oops, if I can, there we go. Okay. Um, so just a, for a brief context, right? So when I talk about population genetics, that's um, a field that looks at um, patterns of genetic diversity um, across um, individuals and populations, and then uses those um, genetic diversity um, estimates to uh, look at evolutionary questions. So to infer um, evolutionary processes or, or demographic processes in some cases like migration. Um, and so uh, one really nice thing about sort of the advent of next generation sequencing is that it's now um, fairly feasible um, and relatively low cost to generate um, very high resolution uh, genotype data for, for individuals from, um, from many populations potentially. Um, and so with those data, you can both look at um, sort of evolutionary processes as well as answer sort of basic descriptive things like how, um, how diverse the particular population is genetically compared to another one um, or how clonal it is. Um, and I'll be talking a little later as well. Um, these data can also be used to extract um, sex ratios um, from organisms that are otherwise tricky to, to determine the sex of. Oops. All right. So um, the, uh, the term population, I think, tends to be a little bit subjective depending on the organism you're working on, sort of what um, what you're going to sort of circumscribe as a population. Um, in, the, in the results I'll share with you today, um, when I refer to a population, I'll be talking about one of these sites that I'm going to show you. So this is my former, um, my former grad student, um, Udbeg Vera, who's now at UC San Diego, doing her PhD there. Um, and so she's collecting actually in that same um, sheep mountains gradient that, that Kirsten showed you in her presentation. So this is the lowest, driest site here. You can see that little blob there, um, this is my thing. Can you guys see my cursor? I don't know, but if you can, that pink thing there is my finger yes. <laughs> so for scale. So the, the canna nervous at this site is extremely tiny. Oops, here we go. Sorry, I need to learn how to forward my slides. There we go. Um, and so this is sort of the, the mid elevation site in a sort of a uh, Joshua tree woodland. You can see it's getting a little more music. Um, and then this is the high elevation site, that Pinyer juniper woodland. Um, and we actually had a rain event. It was the first rain event of the season, actually, um, the night we were there. <laughs> so that's why all the mosses look hydrated. It was very hard to identify them actually in that state because I'm not used to seeing them wet. Um, we did a similar, uh, similar collection at three um, different sort of elevation sites in the Colorado Plateau. Um, and thanks to the Matt Bowker lab for helping us out with these collections. So this is uh, the low elevation site again. Um, here's the mid elevation site, that's Christina, um, one of Matt's grad students. And then this is the, the higher elevation site there as well. And that's Anita there helping us out. So we have these samples um, from uh, two different sort of ele elevation gradients um, from two fairly geographically separated locations, right? The Mojave and then the Colorado Plateau. Um, and so the sort of classic question, I guess, or often in, in population genetics is looking for patterns of differentiation. So genetic differences um, that are fixed in particular populations compared to others. And then asking whether or not that differentiation um, follows patterns that might be sort of considered neutral, like just um, patterns of isolation by distance, we call it. So the idea being that things might be geographically structured just because if your populations are far apart, there's not much of a, a chance that you're going to um, share, share migrants or share genes, and therefore you'll start to sort of drift away from each other um, genetically over time. Um, you can contrast that with a more deterministic um, sort of process like, um, like um, adaptation to particular environments. Um, and so uh, another possibility, right, is that populations may actually be specialized for particular environmental conditions. They may have some local adaptation. Um, and so there you might predict that um, populations that have sort of similar climatic conditions, and in particular, I think precipitation is most important for these guys, right, uh, and the timing of it, um, they may share more um, sort of genetic similarity um, with populations of similar climate, um, even if the um, 
you know, uh, populations are, are more disparate. Um, and so geographic distance becomes less important. Hope that made sense. <laughs> okay, so to add, um, sort of address these questions in our system, um, Ubad and I took those samples from the six populations I showed you. Um, and um, Mel Oliver, actually, who you saw earlier um, in his lab, um, did something called um, restriction associated, associated excuse me, um, uh, genotyping, basically. Um, so restriction. So basically, what you do is you chop up your genome um, into a bunch of small pieces um, using a particular enzyme that cuts a, a certain motif in the DNA, um, and then you sequence those. And so what you end up with are lots of hopefully. Um, the same lo um, location in the genome um, sequenced across multiple individuals that you can then compare for something called single nucleotide polymorphisms, which I'm showing you here. It's basically one site in the DNA. If you consider each of these rows to be a different individual genotype, some individuals have an A at the site and some have a G. Um, and so that's a SNP. And so, um, through various contortions of filtering, which I won't get into here, we ended up with a data set of around a thousand SNPs like this. Um, and these are distributed sort of randomly throughout the genome. I did take out the ones on the sex chromosome just to be on the safe side. There weren't very many, but um, just because that, that might show patterns of divergence between the sexes, but not necessarily uh, populations. And then I had to clone correct the data set. So it turns out that even over thousands of SNPs some um, individuals are genetically identical. <laughs> and so that kind of screws up some of your calculations. So I removed those. Um, and then um, it turns out that that high elevation population in Nevada, the Sheep Mountains, that um, pinion juniper woodland, I, I recovered a few bona fide cannabis there, but the sample size was just too low to be able to sort of include them in the rest of my analyses. So I had to throw that population out. There's something else there <laughs> and it's not canna nervous. So um, yeah, that's the mystery, the mystery species there, which um, we ended up collecting more of than canna nervous, unfortunately. So, so we ended up with five populations and all the, the results that I'll show you here. Um, so if we look at isolation by distance um, versus that sort of um, isolation or differentiation with, with climate that I mentioned. Um, what we can see is that um, on that left-hand panel there, and this is just kind of a graphic using linear regressions. I did um, a different test actually to sort of look for significance, but um, you can see on the x-axis there, it's sort of the geographic or physical distance between two populations. So these dots are, represent pairwise comparisons between populations. Um, and the, um, the y-axis there, FST, is a measure of the differentiation genetically between um, two populations. So as you can see, geographic distance doesn't have much of a relationship with, um, with genetic differentiation. Um, the middle panel, however, shows you MAP, which is mean annual precipitation. So um, it looks like in this case, right, that um, populations that have a similar mean annual precipitation have less genetic differentiation. Um, and then that sort of scales up as you get um, sort of bigger difference in precipitation that translates to um, sort of more genetic differentiation between the populations. And then that last panel there is just to show you that there's not much of a correlation because there could be right between sort of the climatic variables and the, and the distance um, between populations, but in this case, not too significant. So that's interesting. I mean, this is starting to suggest, I'm, I'm working on analyses now using um, the individual alleles and the actual individuals in these pairwise comparisons instead of the population level stuff. But um, so this is kind of TBA, but I think it's kind of an intriguing, at least first result here. All right, so this is a complex figure, but the thing I really want to point out here, so this is using, um, first I used uh, an K-means clustering algorithm to basically ask the question of sort of what number of groups sort of best best describes the variation I see in my genetic data. And it turns out the answer is four, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so um, that top thing there is a, is a discriminant analysis of principal components. So it's basically just a way of sort of looking at the variation in the data and saying, okay, if I have four groups, um, sort of which, um, which of those four groups does this sort of variance um, describe the individuals as belonging to? 
Um, and so it's sort of maximizing um, between group variation as opposed to within group variation. Um, and so if you look, and that's a sort of a bar graph showing the assignments of individual genotypes to those groups um, by their actual population they came from, the top there. And then the same data are just described as a sc uh, scatter plot here to the right. Um, and I'm just gonna focus on that little cluster of green dots. Those are individuals that came from the low elevation site. Um, and if you go in and look at the individual loci that are contributing the most to sort of discriminating this little green cluster here, um, it's kind of intriguing. So you can actually go in and look, those colored dots represent sort of loci that contribute the most to that, that x-axis variation. Um, and you can see, I'll just point out that one of those is the same, um, that LL, sorry, that um, serine threonine protein kinase receptor um, that's involved in signaling that Mel pointed out. And a couple of these also pop up in our um, transcript, um, that transcriptomics um, data that, that Mel and also Jenna showed you a version of that as well. But um, some of these proteins are also sort of increased with heat shock, which I find interesting. So this is TBA and it's just kind of hand wavy at the moment, but it is um, kind of an interesting direction to go as well. Okay, oops, so I have a few minutes. I just wanted to mention one of my favorite things to look into actually in Centricia is its sex ratios. I find it really fascinating. Um, and so I may run out of time here um, during this presentation, but we can, we can talk about it more in breakouts maybe. But sex expression in general, if you think about those carbon balance curves that Kirsten showed earlier, right? Um, sex expression is relatively energetically costly. And if you're already sort of living in a marginal carbon balance gain or maybe even loss, it's probably not in your best interest to put a bunch of extra energy into sex, right? Or into um, making gamma tangia. So it turns out that sex is pretty uncommon in Canna nervous. Um, and when we do um, observe sex expression, it's usually in more um, mesic or more sort of permissive habitats. And um, it's usually female. Um, it's pretty rare to find female um, sex organs on, on plants from the field. Um, and when we do find males, they tend to be observed in more um, shaded and again, more moist kind of like microsites. Um, and just as a quick review here, the sporophyte in the middle is diploid and it has both the U and the V sex chromosomes. Um, and so when you make spores from the sporophyte, you should get either U, right, this haploid female, or V, which is that haploid male. We use U and V just to kind of differentiate from the X and Y in, in diploid organisms, right, that express sex in the diploid state because in mosses, the diploid is, is unsexed. So another question we sort of have, or at least I had, is um, do uh, patterns of male sex expression, that is the production of gametangia, really um, correlate with the actual presence of males, right? Or maybe males just have a higher threshold of energy they need to have stored before they express gametangia. Um, and also sort of on, along the same lines, right? Do we see um, male sex expression at the micro scale, in other words, we really see males expressing sex in shady sites. Does that sort of scale up to the actual population sex ratios? In other words, are there more males present in sites that are, are more music and less stressful, um, which you might predict. Sorry, that was the prediction. I was gonna make you make the prediction, but I'm almost out of time, so <laughs> never mind. Um, okay, so uh, sort of given the, given the uh, sort of general macro habitats, um, sort of gestalt, I guess, if you will, that I showed you in those early slides, where do you might predict that I picked up the most male or female genotypes? Well, I'll let you think about that. Would it be in the super hot, dry areas or would it be in the higher elevations? Would you find more males there where it's a little cooler and wetter? I, I suspected that we would find them in the cooler, wetter sites um, in general, but these are the actual results. Um, and as you can see, I found the most males actually at that very low elevation site in the sheep range, um, the hottest, driest location. <laughs> and then they sort of attenuate as you, as you go higher in elevation. Um, and so we can discuss the, um, the potential reasons for this, um, maybe later in the breakout rooms and think about it. But I think it comes down to there being um, this sort of, um, I guess tug of war, if you will, or sort of, uh, sort of um, 
different uh, pressures, if you will, um, in terms of um, fitness, in terms of vegetative fitness or um, sort of uh, fitness of individual clones in their environment. So if you're sort of em energy limited, um, the most sort of um, fit, I guess, to feel or like most robust or um, plant might be one that doesn't um, sort of sink any energy into sex expression and just throws all of its energy into sort of clonal reproduction and survival in stressful conditions. Um, and then as it turns out, females actually input less energy into gamete gametangial production, excuse me, than males. And so males incur a slightly higher cost of sex pre-fertilization. Post-fertilization, it's probably um, females that are supporting sporophytes that incur the, the highest cost. Um, but that contrasts with um, sort of the other idea of fitness, which is sort of more classic, I guess, idea of fitness being like um, your opportunities to um, sort of recombine your genes with another organism and then get your genes into spores that ultimately go and perpetuate the species, right, and colonize lo new locations. And it's only those individuals that do sex that have the capacity or the potential to sort of um, go out and, and persist in the very long term and also, um, you know, travel to new locations as well. And so while it may be sort of in the short term, it might be in the sort of individual's best interest to just clonally propagate. Um, long term, it's only those individuals that, that do do sex, right, that are going to sort of make it into the, the next generations, ultimately. So I, I'm totally out of time. So I'll leave it at that. But we can talk about um, patterns of, of uh, sex, actual sex ratios um, and stress in, in the breakouts, maybe. Thank you.